day 90 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Holly, and welcome to the Heart Dive podcast. Hey, I'm back. Yep, it's me, Holly. I'm going to do Sunday, Easter Sunday, if you're doing this live with us. And if you've already went to church or you're on your way to church, or perhaps you did church earlier today, or maybe you can't get to church, I'm just letting you know that we do have the rest of our Easter PDF available uh, where we kind of connect the Old Testament with the New Testament. It's at heartdive.org slash Easter. And today is Easter Sunday and he is risen. Christosynasty. Yep, I married a Greek. And so on Easter, we would do the Christosynasty and then we'd hit the eggs together. Um, That was a really cool experience that I got to do at the Greek Orthodox Church with my husband. Um, He is not Greek Orthodox today, so, (laughs) but I'm glad that I have that experience because it gives me a diverse background to be able to talk about different environments um, and religions, but ultimately it is the word of God that matters most. Are we in God's word? Do we understand God's word? And is it transforming our lives? Yes. If you're here today, I know from the comments yesterday, I know from the comments for the last six, seven, eight months, the emails coming in that the word of God is transforming hearts. And so today, as we jump into chapters three, four, and five of Judges, as we continue to walk through, what is it, like three to 400 years, um, all the scholars, they kind of bounce back and forth. It was 299 all the way to 450. So we're going to say somewhere between 300 and 400 years, Judges covers. And so throughout this time, again, we're going back to the cycle of sin that the Israelites have forgotten their God, the God, Yahweh, and now they're turning away and then turning back and then turning away and then turning back. But before we dive back into Judges, let's bow our hearts and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today looking for the daily manna that we need in our lives. We need your word. We need you to pour into us, especially today as we reflect on your son's sacrifice, that he gave his life for us so that we can walk debt free, that he took the consequence of sin upon himself. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you already had this story written out all the way to the end. And we know in the end, the victory is won. It's already in your hands. And so today, once again, we give this time to you. We give this time in the car. We give this time in front of the television, on the screen, wherever it may be. And if someone was not able to get to your house of worship today, make wherever they are the house of worship, that you would make that place a holy ground, that they will see your word come alive inside of them and cause your word pierces through bone and marrow. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. Judges chapter three. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war to teach war to those who had not known it before. Oh, that's a tongue twister. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Havites, Hivites, who lived on Mount Lebanon, Lebanon, from Mount Balhermon, as far as Labo Hamath, they were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pizzerites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And what are y'all thinking today? <laughs> Kanoi's not here. I always think gigabytes. <laughs> and their daughters, they took to themselves for wives. And their own daughters, they gave to their sons and they served their gods. If we go back up here to the top part of verses one through six, you see here it says that to test Israel. And then over here in the orange, might know war to teach war to those who had not known it before. You might be asking yourself, why is God testing the people? Well, you see, 
It is God's wisdom. So remember, we look for the character of God. In this case, this is the wisdom of God. And we have some cross references to other places in the Bible over here. Testing Genesis 22, Deuteronomy 13, Second Chronicles, James. And what's the point of testing? It refines. Warfare skills are needed for the people um, who were born in the wilderness. Now remember, these are the people that came from Egypt. They were part of the Exodus. They came through the desert and they didn't face any warfare, any really trouble out there. Trouble. My R's. While editing, I noticed that my R's are a struggle bus. I apologize for that one, but it is part of my accent. I had my tonsils removed as an adult and now my R's are not enunciated. Has any other adults had that done and lost their ability to say certain sounds? I'm intrigued. Okay, back to the point. <laughs> so warfare was not something that this generation knew. And why does it matter? Because they're going into a land that is not their own. Now, a lot of it was handed to them, you know, because God helped them like, you know, defeat Jericho and other things like that. But now with the oppression that's happening, they have enemies on all sides. They're inexperienced and inexperience will lead to mistakes. And so they need to get experience to do better. Here's a good example. This, this YouTube thing, being new on this YouTube channel feels like I'm learning to walk on a wobbly boat. Like I don't have my sea legs yet. Yesterday, um, Saturday's video, day 89, I was editing and I was finding so many errors and I was like, oh, can I just redo it? But I can't because I really want to step up and help Kanoi. And that means that I'm going to be a little wobbly on the sea boat. All right. I don't have my sea legs yet when it comes to this YouTube thing. And you, it's scary. This is scary. I have enjoyed staying in my itty bitty little bubble, talking to like 20 people on my podcast and like 10 people on my Instagram. And that was nice. Stepping out onto the Heart Dive Ministry platform, this is scary. But you know what is scarier? Not listening to God. Not stepping into what he has purposed or commissioned for me or whoever. I want to listen to his nudges. I want the spirit to guide me and to lead me. So I will get stronger. I will get better by every day that I do this. If we look at Kanoi's from January 1st, 2023, and we look at Kanoi's from two days ago, Kanoi is flying through those because she has repeated this process over and over and over. She is no longer inexperienced. So like soldiers, soldiers need to go to war. They need to battle. You can do all you want in a gym or in a training yard, or you can do all you want talking to a video camera and never actually hitting record and publish because that's not going to get me or you anywhere. We have to hit record. We have to hit publish. We have to go to war to get the experience, to get better, to serve. It is out of necessity that we learn new ways to cope with the fiery darts of the enemy. Because you know what? He's going to come at us with all the things of the world. He's going to come at us with despair and worry and doubt and anxiety. And we have to learn how to gear ourselves up for the spiritual warfare as well. I know I use YouTube and I know we talked about war. But inexperience in the spiritual warfare will also make us vulnerable to attack. So the Israelites had the promised land, but they had to fight to keep it. And they were coming from all sides. They were coming physically all around them and the enemy was coming inside. The greatest warfare was happening inside. They were having spiritual oppression as they turned away from God. So heart check. Are you in a testing period? Have you learned new ways to prepare for battle or are you at the mercy of the enemy? So in verse six, the daughters they took to themselves for wives and their own daughters they gave to their sons and served their gods. Right there, they have this intermingling of relationships. You have the chosen people hanging out and making families with the sinful people that the Lord said remove. And what's interesting to note here is that this is kind of like fruit. There is an unequal match or being yoked with an unbeliever, which, you know, they address again in the New Testament. So 
God knew what was going to happen. Remember, it goes back to what we talked about yesterday in Judges 1 and 2 about tolerating, assimilating, and then imitating. And so as you, you know, become assimilated in these different cultures, what's going to happen? You're going to imitate that. You're going to worship those gods. And so it's kind of like a piece of rotten fruit. And we have all these children around here and they love fruit and they're like, yeah, 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 we want blueberries, we want strawberries, we want pears and apples. But yet, whenever I get fruit, only one rotten fruit is what it takes for the whole batch to go bad. Like the good fruit next to the rotten fruit is not going to overtake the rottenness of it. The rotten fruit is going to grow throughout. It's going to corrupt. It's going to overtake the good. Even though that it tries as much as it can, um, we don't have that power. We need the Lord to indwell and dwell in us. We need the Holy Spirit to help us. But that also doesn't make us invulnerable. When people choose to worship other gods, they forget the Lord, their God. This highlights the dangers of relativism. Now, relativism is a really wordy way of saying that in one culture, people may say all, you know, this is okay in this culture. So this must, you know, be an okay, morally right. And so, for example, I lived in Africa and there were things that they would do to females and the whole culture thought it was morally right. Yet in our culture, we would say that's morally wrong. Like you don't do that to women. And that was a really hard cultural relativism. And so what's happening is there's a relativism that's happening um, and the, uh, where people are saying, oh, well, the Canaanites are doing it so we can do it. All right, enough of that. And following, so this highlights the dangers of relativism and following one's own moral compass. So are we following our moral compass or God's? And, um, and this is the phrase that's repeated, remember, seven times. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. All right, there was no king. So they just did whatever they wanted. There was no, though they had God, they were looking to a king. They were like, oh, the Canaanites all have kings and they all have, you know, someone to look to. And they and, and they just kept trying to replace God with things and people, idols. So heart check. How can we avoid letting harmful influences spoil the good in our lives? Much like how a rotten fruit can ruin a bunch. Verse 7. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore, the anger of the Lord. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and He sold them into the hand of. Okay, I really tried to learn this one. Kushan, Rishathim. Rish, Rishathim. <laughs> God wants my heart, not my pronunciations. He was the king of Meso Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rashathim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel, who saved them. Othanel, Othanel the son of Kenez, Caleb's younger brother, the spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan. And the Lord gave Cushan, Rashathiam, king of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan, Rashathiam. So the land had rest forty years. Then Othanel, the son of Kenez, died. Okay, on here you can see that I have my colors again. This is showing up yellow, but in my, Bi in my Bible these are <laughs> orange, and this is pink. So the orange again is showing the sin nature of the people. They kindled the anger of the Lord against them because they, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Othanel was raised up. He had the spirit of the Lord upon him, and his name means Lion of God. All right, and also this name that I'm struggling to say, they don't think it's an actual real name. Um, 
it's his name means double wickedness. And so they think it's like kind of a pun on his name. But Othanil, he is a man of faith and courage, but his strength came from God. The spirit of the Lord was upon him. I really have loved seeing that in here where the Lord's spirit comes upon people. But I want to remind you that the spirit of the Lord is available to all who receive the salvation of Jesus Christ. He is available now. The spirit of the Lord is available right now in us. So I just want to like emphasize that today on Easter Sunday, if you're watching in real time, to be reminded of his sacrifice and the comforter that he left here for us. Now, what was interesting about the Spirit of the Lord in the Old Testament was that the Spirit of the Lord, it was a temporary indwelling, uh, normally empowering during times of need. And like I just said, the New Testament, it is permanently indwelt in us now through salvation. So now that we've started looking at real judges, I wanted to show this one post-it note. I um, Knowing who the judges are, I think will really help you understand kind of the process of the rest of the book as well. So on this post-it, we have 12 judges. We have six major and six minor. The major ones are Othanil, which, you know, he was the first one. Then we have Ehud, Deborah, Gideon, Gideon, and Jetheth, and then Samson. Uh, now, a lot of people already know about Samson, so we'll hear about him later. The minor ones are Shamgar, Tola, uh, Hayir, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. And then these two right here are honorable mentions, and Eli and Samuel. But they come in first Samuel. They're not in Judges, so that's why they shouldn't be included here. But they're considered Judges, just not in the book, um, or Prophets. So, that's that little post-it. Let's move on to our next Judge, Ehud. Verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, Moab is the people of the descendants of Lot and his daughter. This is in Genesis 19.37. So, the Moab Moabites are that sinful descendants of Lot and his daughter. So, Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So, right here, this is their sin nature and then the oppression, retribution from the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. Now, first, he couldn't conquer them by himself, so he had to get, you know, two bullies to join up with him to make his forces a little more, you know, beefed up. And then city of Palms, we know that that is Jericho. Now, what's interesting about Jericho, there's a curse. All right, so the curse is, um, upon Jericho is from Deuteronomy and in Joshua. Joshua states that anyone who tries to claim that city will have a curse upon them, that no one will be able to do that. So already there was a curse upon him. So him having even any kind of time of conquering Jericho was a little, you know, provision from the Lord, but he oppressed the people. And so his day was coming. It was already numbered. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. Now what's interesting about him being a Benjamite is the Benjamite tribe is known as the right hand, and he's a left-handed man. So this peculiar attribute of Ehud actually is what saves and delivers the people. So don't ever underestimate the gifts that the Lord gives you. And I guess this is a mini heart check. How are you using these gifts? Or do you have something that you think is so minuscule that God would never use it like being left-handed? And then here you go. Ehud saying, you know, being left-handed is actually what allowed him to become the deliverer. All right, so back to verse 15 in chapter 3. The Lord sent the deliverer, Ehud, the left-handed man. The people of Israel sent a tribute, 
by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. So a cubit in length is about 18 inches, and it being on his right thigh means that the guards were not going to check that leg because most people in society were right-handed. So the sword would go on the left leg. No one's going to look on the right thigh. So, and he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. The tribute is the yearly taxes or a tribute to the king, you know, keeping him happy. Um, but I'm sure he got fat on it because Eglon means calf. So he was being fattened with all the spoils from the chosen people. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal. Now the idols, they're unsure if those are idols, um, like statues, idols, um, or the monument. But they think it's actual idols at Gilgal because perhaps he got really angry. And this is where he was like, his righteous anger was kindled against Eglon and what the people were doing there with the idols. And said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God. I have a message from God to you. All right, so this is a warning. Remember, I was going to say, if you have little ears listening, this is where it gets a little gruesome. All right, give you time. All right, let's go. And he rose from his seat, and Ehud reached with his left hand and took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Oh, how lovely. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. So what they um, think is by not pulling the sword out, he didn't bleed and leave like a bloody trail. Um, and also, you know, taking the evidence with him would have been a little obvious. Uh, and so, yeah, his name meant calf and like a calf. Yeah. Eglon met his end. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed, but when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them. There lay their lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Syrah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies the Moabites into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. 80 years. This is the longest rest after a deliverer. And I have a little chart that I got from the Logos software. Logos. Let's see if I can find the paper. So right here, we have the judges and their rule, the oppressors over here. So remember, we talked about Ethnel. He, they had eight years of oppression and then 40 years of rest. And then you have Ehud and Eglon was the king. They had 18 years of oppression and then 80 years of rest. Now, not all of the judges received rest after um, they were delivered by the deliverers, the judges. Um, but... I find it um, significant that Ehud is the one that got 80 years of rest. And there was no lack of 
listening to his calling, which brings me back to of spirit of the Lord. I had a heart check for that and I didn't do it. So I'm going to do it now and I'm not going to try to edit that and make, make it make sense. <laughs> so Ethnil and Ehud and who we're about to read about next, Shamgar, they all were given a commission by the Lord and they were chosen they, a commission. It was an assignment given from the Lord to deliver the people. They were chosen by the spirit of the Lord and he, they were gifted. Remember it said gifted with um, an indwelling of wisdom, courage, and power for a divine task. So unlike assignments for school or for your boss, um, these commissions come from God and carry a profound significance. It transcends any mere human authority. Um, it taps into our divine callings that hopefully ignites like a sense of purpose inside of all of us, a spiritual empowerment beyond anything that we could find here on the earth. It says that we should store our treasures, treasures up in heaven. Okay, and how do we store our treasures up by, you know, obeying God down here with the commission that he's given us. And so it's not about completing the task as much as it's aligning ourselves with God's plan, being obedient to him and having a willing heart and stepping out into whatever journey that he has for us. Um, so heart check, consider the great commission. Are you excited about your assignment from the Lord? All right. So now we've moved to verse 31. This is our um, third judge. After him was Shamgar, the son of Aneth, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad. And he also saved Israel. That's it. One line. Nothing significant. Let's move on. Not. <laughs> Actually, really love that. He's even in here. One little liner and boom, that's it. And we, you might even like skip over it and keep going. But what I saw was such significance because I trust my Lord, the God. I, I trust God so much that even the smallest, most minute thing in the Bible has meaning. And so what I call this is the small yes. Now, if you follow the newsletter, you know that last weekend, I know I'm dating this again, I went uh, away for the weekend and it was a retreat. And while we were there, we were talking about stepping out in purpose, being commissioned. And one of them in particular was, what, what's our small yes? What are we saying yes to for the Lord? So Shamgar, he said a small yes. Now he's using an ox goad. What is an ox goad? Uh, today we'd call it kind of like a cattle prod. Who uses these? A farmer. Again, what do we what does the Bible say about farmers? They're like the most insignificant, like shepherds. People who are out there farming, take care of the land, you know, very blue collar, getting their hands dirty, and um, living a life in the dirt. I get that. It's the not extraordinary people that Jesus chose and that God continually chooses. Remember, he just chose Rahab in the city of Jericho, a prostitute, and he just chose a farmer who destroyed how many? 600 Philistines with a stick with a little point on the end? Hallelujah. Amen. Because he said, yes, a little small yes. Okay. What little yes are we saying? Okay. So, there is no, there is nothing insignificant about being obedient to God. And there's nothing, nothing insignificant about Shamgar. Yes, he has one little line in Judges, but it has a profound impact on God's kingdom because he was obedient and he was, he became a deliverer for the Lord. He was commissioned. So with this one simple act of faith, he played a crucial role, crucial role in delivering Israel from oppression Though it doesn't say that there was any rest, I know. But just like Shamgar, our own willingness to obey God, even in the smallest manner, matters, can lead to significant outcomes and bring glory to his name. So, heart check. <laughs> that one was hard. Heart check. Have you said yes to the Lord? It's Easter Sunday. Have you said yes? Chapter 4. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in, reigned in Hazar. 
The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Heroshith Hagoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Do She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinom from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, go gather your men at Mount Tabar, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulon, and I will draw out Sisera and the general of Jabin's army to meet you by the river Kishon, Kishon with his chariot, chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, I will go. If you will go, Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. But for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulon and Naphtali to Kadesh. And 10,000 men went up at his hills, and Deborah went up with him. So Barak calls on Zebulon and Naphtali to go with him, and he has this big giant army coming with him now. But he was afraid to go without Deborah. So who is this woman of influence? Who is this woman that people go and seek wise counsel with? Because um, I want to meet her. I want this Titus 2 woman in my life. Hallelujah, amen. When I hear about women that in the Bible bucking up against the traditions, I know our God is just, just so amazing that it doesn't matter what the traditions or the status quo is. He's placing a woman at the top here. She is a judge. This guy was scared to go into battle without her. That says amazing things. And what it also says is that there's no set credentials to be an effective servant of the Lord. All right, let's look at what the only essential credential you need to be a servant of the Lord. It says right here, to be an effective servant of God, a heart that is willing to be used by him. That's it. Do you, heart check, do you have a willing heart to serve God? That's it. Deborah had that. Let's move on. Now Heber the Kenite has separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Zananim, which is near Kadesh. All right, Kadesh. Where, where's everyone going? That, that location. All right. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abunim, had gone up Mount Tabar, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron. Woo! Chariots of iron, going to cause some issues. And all the men who were with him from Heroshith Hagamayam. <laughs> oh, this is. And all the men who were with him from Heroshith Hagoyam to the river Kishon, Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? Now, this is important because what this is saying is that it's the Lord's sovereign nature. Like, it's just his will. It's not swords and spears that will, you know, win the battle. That's secondary to God's will. He said, right here, does not the Lord go out before you. Does not the Lord go out before you in all your battles? If you're leaning to him and you're trusting him and uh, following his commandments and in obedience to the heavenly father, then he goes out before you. Again, I'm using the example of doing this on YouTube and stumbling over all these words. My heart is willing. My tongue is twisted, but I'm still going to go out because the Lord goes out before me. 
And so I'm going to continue to step forward and keep making the next step because my Lord is fighting my battles. And victory is won. Let's keep going. So Barak went down from Mount Tabar with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed, routed, all right? So that means that he stopped them, Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. Now, this routed piece actually comes... Um, is explained in the next chapter. So we won't even like mess with that. But I just want to let you know that we learn more about this word and all of the strategic battle of this. Um, we learn more about this strategic battle about this specific deliverance with Deborah and Barak. So Sisera had to flee on foot. Um, so that means that the chariots were no good. And also I want to kind of point out up here that you, uh, it says now Heber the Kenite, and he is the Kenites, right? So father-in-law of Moses and where he at, why, why is that thrown in there? Because it's significant. It's part of the story. It's part of God's sovereign hand. Remember what um, Deborah said to Barak? She said, well, since you couldn't go up there without me coming with you, therefore not obeying God and trusting him that you know, this man, Cicero, was del is right here handed to you. He's already worked something else out. Like, here you go. All right. Plan B. Though all plans are plan A for God. Um, so anyways. <laughs> I just want to point out that nothing is insignificant in the book. In the holy book. So, and Barak pursued the chariots and the army of Hirsch... <laughs> And Barak pursued the chariots and the army of Harosheth Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. But they need the military leader because damage could still be done. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, Jael the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazar, and the house of Heber at the Kenite. And Jael, Jael I'm sorry, how would you say this? Jael, Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg. Warning for little ears. Warning for little ears. Okay, let's keep going. So the wife took the tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was laying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. Well, at least it was a quick death. But gruesome. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin the king of Canaan before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin the king of Canaan until they destroyed Jabin king of Canaan. So, just like Deborah said, because Barak did not trust the Lord, the glory went to someone else. And so here, the bravery and the courage of this wife with using whatever tool she had available, she gets the glory because she was obedient, because she had the courage to honor God and not herself. Now, the circumstances here are very odd. It says that her family had a truce with this Sisera's family. And so therefore he felt safe. But she obviously knew of God, of Yahweh, because of Moses' influence on that family. Remember, Moses' father-in-law, this is his family that has pitched a tent here in the desert. Now, I want to show you a map that I have. I've pulled it up here on the screen. Uh, I like throwing the digitals on here. 
And this is the path of Deborah and Barak as they defeat the Canaanites. As you can see here, you have the two orange lines coming down from different directions and where they met at the city of Megiddo. And then you can see how Caesarea fled on foot all the way in that purple line. Like he fled on foot, like really far, running for his life. And yet God's providence, his sovereignty was still there. And it was just a hammer and a tent peg. The most unlikeliest of tools. So the reflection that I have with this passage is that even though she was a woman, bucks against the system, the traditions of a woman going to battle or, you know, taking matters into her own hands, and then also using whatever she had at her fingertips, the ingenuity of using that. It just tells me that God is bigger and greater and it, 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 he uses whatever he can. And so heart check, are you using all the available tools at your fingertips? Chapter five, the song of Deborah and Barak. Now I want to try to read this in full capacity here uh, because it's it's, it's a song. It's a poem. It's meant to bring glory to God. So let's sing it or say it the way that it was intended to bring God glory. Then sang Deborah and Barak, son of Abinam, on that day, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned and travelers kept to the byways. The villages ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. When new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates, with shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk by the way to the sound of musicians at the watering places, there they repeat the righteous tri triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villagers in Israel. Then down to the gates marched the people of the Lord. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, break out in song. Arise, Barak, lead away your captives, O son of Abinom. Then down marched the remnant of the noble. The people of the Lord marched down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim, the root, they marched down into the valley. Following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From Mashar, marched down the commanders. And from Zebulon, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. The princess of Issachar came with Deborah. And Issachar faithful to Barak, and into the valley they rushed at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben there were great searchings of heart. Why did you sit still among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben there were great searchings of the heart. Gilead stayed behind Jordan, and Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landings. Zebulon is a people who risked their lives to the death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. The kings came, they fought, then fought the kings of Canaan. At Tanakh, by the waters of Megiddo, they got no spoils of silver. From heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera, the torrent Kishan swept them away. An ancient torrent, the torrent Kishan, march on, my soul, with might. Then loud beat the horse's hoofs with the galloping, galloping of his steeds. Curse, Marah, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants thoroughly. 
because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. He asked for water, and she gave milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera, she crushed his head, she shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. Out of the window she peered, the mother of Sisera welled through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest princesses answer, indeed, she answers herself, have they not found and divided the spoil, a womb or two for every man, spoil of dyed materials for Sisera, spoiled of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck of it as spoil. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends will be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the land had rest for 40 years. What a mighty, mighty song. How glorious is it that Deborah not only obeyed God, walked out in obedience, like she was a faith in action kind of person, but then also praised him, worshiped him with her, not just, you know, lip service. Like she literally is sharing so much in this one poem that I want to share the emphasis of poetry in uh, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, okay, so what we're going to talk about real quick is Hebrew poetry. Now, poetry in itself can be a little discombobulating. You're like, oh, I don't really understand all this. But in this instant, um, each poem is unique to the circumstances that it's being placed into the Bible. This one in particular is appealing to not only your emotional senses, but also to persuasion. It, it has a rational appeal because it's dropped into the narrative text of Judges. We're, we're having stories and then boom, here's a, here's a poem. And so she's appealing to your emotions um, with some of the stories of Sisera's mother and then Jael with the tent peg, but then also kind of like the heart condition of the people and also appealing to the reason, reasoning. And so the, there's three sections of the poem. The first section is the heart condition of Israel is what I'm calling it, but it's really the condition of Israel. Like what is going on? Why do we even need a deliverer? And then the second part is the actual battle, but in a beautiful emotional kind of way. <laughs> and then the third part is kind of like vignettes of the little, little snippets of the two women um, that Deborah wanted to highlight. And neither one of them are her. She highlighted Jael, the one, the woman that gets all the glory. And I know I'm probably saying her name all wrong. And then Sisera's mother, um, who's like waiting expectantly for her son, and yet he's not showing up. All right. So in the first section of of here, I wanted to mention that the condition of Israel has gotten really, really, really bleak. Like. Everything is being torn away from their hands. Like they, they can't travel. It's very unsafe and very violent. And so they needed a deliverer more than ever because it was just not safe. Their farmlands were being destroyed. Their cattle were being stolen. And there was no end in sight. And they just couldn't, there's no livelihood. They were not safe. As we go into the next section, this is where my eyes were open. I was just something about this one verse that really spoke to me, especially in the midst of an entire poem slash song that wants to glorify the Lord. How in the world did Deborah get to this point? Verse 12. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, break out in song. Awake, awake, Holly. Awake, awake, Kanoi. Awake, awake, heart divers. Awake, awake, Bible study friends. Are we awake? Are we awake to the goodness of God? Are we awake to all the things that he has before us? Or are we walking with our eyes wide shut? 
Are we walking through this life unsure and not even aware? I heard this song today and it just seriously. And so today, as I was preparing for this, I um, stumbled across some new music by the artist Ben Fuller, and I'd love to read some of the lyrics. So I want to read the chorus to you because the chorus is what really speaks out in particular to this verse. So today on Easter Sunday, I hope it speaks to you. You said, rise up. You said, rise up. I didn't know I was sleeping. I didn't know I was lost. You put the skeleton key in and opened the door to my heart. I'm wide awake. I'm wide awake. So heart check. Are you wide awake? And with that, let's dive into our deep dive questions. Are you walking out the Great Commission? How could you better equip yourself to share the gospel more boldly? Are you using your unique gifts to bring honor to the Lord or yourself? How does God's sovereignty over purpose make you feel? In light of Easter, what sacrifice have you made to further the gospel lately? What does praise look like to you? Is it important to incorporate it into your spiritual disciplines? And is it easier to worship corporately or privately? And why is that? Write your own song of praise, giving God the glory. Place yourself into Deborah's poem. So dear Heavenly Father, thank you that your son died on the cross for us today. Today we come before you with hearts full of gratitude for the ultimate sacrifice your son made on the cross for us. We acknowledge that we are unworthy and our deeds are like filthy rags, yet you have loved us unconditionally and offer us redemption through Jesus Christ. As we reflect on the journey of the Israelites from Joshua all the way to Samuel, we recognize our own struggles and focusing on what truly matters. Obeying your commandments, listening to your voice, and walking in surrender to your will. Just as De Deborah was sought after for her wisdom under the palm tree, may we also seek wisdom and knowledge in your word. May our lives radiate with your light, drawing others to seek you. Empower us, Lord, to face the battles of life with courage, even with the smallest of tools and the most unlikely of weapons, knowing that victory is already ours through Christ. May we never forget the redemption and deliverance you have provided for us throughout history. Lord, we offer our small yes to you today. Surrender our lives to your purpose and glory. Fill us afresh with your spirit, transforming us from the inside out so that we may live out our calling to spread the good news of our gospel. Awake us, Lord, awake us. Thank you for the comforter, your spirit, who guides us. And comfort us, Lord, and lead us according to your good and pleasing will. We love you, Lord, and in Jesus' name, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer. I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, Thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.